Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at how you can calculate the electrical potential produced by a charged conducting sphere. Now this is the first part of the video. Now the nice thing about doing it for this problem is it also applies to a conducting shell or a shell that has a charge on it. Because if you charge a sphere, guess what? The charge goes to the surface and there is no charge inside that conductor because the electric field has to be zero inside that conductor. And you can show that using Gauss's law. I have a lot of videos on that that show you how to calculate the electric field everywhere in space here. That's not the purpose of this video. We wanna focus on calculating the electrical potential. All right, so again, if you have a shell, again, the charge is right on that surface layer, and you wanna be able to use this equation up above to calculate the electrical potential at a point outside the shell versus inside the shell. All right, uh, I, in part two, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how you can also calculate this uh, electrical potential by integrating over the surface of the charges, okay? How do you set up that integral and how you can evaluate it, again, at a point outside and inside the shell? Part two is a little bit harder mathematically, but we're gonna get to the same result. It's always good to have multiple ways to know how to solve a problem. All right, like with all my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to Physics Ninja. It's the best way to support what I do. All right, let's get started. All right, so we're first uh, gonna consider the electrical potential outside the spherical conductor of radius R. So I have my point, my green point right here, it is outside, and this is my expression that I want to evaluate. Now I'm coming in from very, very far away. Typically we say we set the reference point at infinity, so that means that our potential is going to be zero when I'm really, really far away. So what I need to is I need to evaluate this integral here. Now again, I'm considering the field outside of the sphere. So what that means is outside the sphere, if you use Gauss's law, you should know that the electric field is simply given by the same expression as a point charge, right? It behaves exactly similarly to that of a point charge as long as the point that I'm evaluating is outside the radius of the sphere, which is what we have in this case. All right, next thing we do is we simply substitute inside that integral. Now what I've done here is I've grouped together um, the constant in the front of the electric field here, and I've called that the constant k. This is what is typically done, okay? So k is simply one over four pi epsilon zero. All right, so now all we're left with is we're evaluating this integral now. Um, pretty straightforward because it's just a one over R squared. So when you integrate that, what you get is a minus one over R. And now you have to evaluate it between both of those limits. So our next step now in this calculation is we're simply substituting the limits here, uh, R and infinity inside this expression. You could take the negative sign in the front so it'll cancel with the other one. All right, and this is what it looks like now, right? Once you substitute those limits, and again, we're using the fact that our reference point is at infinity, so this first term here we can cancel out. And again, the one over infinity, once you substitute that lower limit here, goes to zero as well. So what we're left with at the end is the potential as a function of the distance from the center as long as that distance is bigger than the radius of the sphere. And again, this looks like, right, just a standard expression you find in a textbook for the potential of a point charge, Q, if you're a certain distance away from it. So just like the electric field, the electrical potential behaves very, very similarly to that of a point charge. Okay, so now we're interested in finding the electrical potential for a point now that is inside the sphere. So notice I move this green point inside the sphere. So we're gonna start with the same expression, okay? Now I'm integrating all the way from infinity to this final point inside the sphere. So it's a little bit different now. So the first thing we have to do now is we have to remember that the field changes when you're outside versus inside. Outside you have the expression up above, Inside, remember, you have zero for inside the, uh, the sphere. So guess what? Now we substitute. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this integral down into two integrals, right? Because I want to go from infinity to R, but since the field changes from one to the other, guess what? You got to go from infinity all the way to the radius, to the surface, and then I integrate from the surface all the way to the final point, which is located at some distance away from the center. So the first integral is 
The field is the field from the outside, and the second one, well, it's simple because it's a zero. So that one you can simply cancel out right away. You don't have to worry about. There is no electric field inside. Now the first integral looks exactly like the first one we did, right? Except for what? Well, that upper limit now is actually the radius of the sphere. It's no longer just the final position of the point. So what does that mean? So when you evaluate that integral and you substitute the limits, again, we take our reference point at infinity uh, to be equal to zero, so you can cancel this out. Now once you substitute these limits, you can see what's going to happen. Once you substitute infinity here, you're going to get zero for that term. But when you substitute the upper limit right here for the radius of the sphere, uh, this is what you get. So you get to my final expression now that is kq divided by the radius of the sphere, which is a constant value. And this is true for any point that is inside this radius. So that's different, okay? Although it has an r in the denominator over here, it's actually a constant value. So let's think about this for a minute. This is what we have, okay? And this is really the key, is that for outside, our electrical potential looks like a point charge, okay? KQ divided by R, where R is the distance from the center of that sphere to the point where I'm evaluating the electrical potential. But inside the sphere, we have KQ divided by the radius of the object that we're looking at, either the conductor or that shell. So the key thing to remember for this problem is that the potential is not zero inside, even though the electric field is zero inside. The potential is a constant value, which is what we call an equipotential, okay? That whole conductor is an equipotential. It has a constant electrical potential. All right, it's now time for part two. Part two, again, we're gonna find the electrical potential at every point outside and inside using a direct integration method, okay? So let's get started. So the first thing we gotta do is I'm gonna choose a point and since it's a spherical symmetry, the way I've shown it here, I'm gonna choose the point to lie on the z-axis because I wanna use spherical coordinates to evaluate this integral. Now again, it doesn't matter. You could rotate the object and place it anywhere, but if I'm gonna use just standard spherical coordinates, uh, this is kind of a simple way of setting it up. I'm gonna define the angle theta between the z-axis and toward um, this vector r here that goes from the center of the sphere all the way to the surface of the sphere. Okay, and again, that distance is simply the radius of that sphere. Now again, I'm assuming that it's a conductor or a spherical shell, so all of the charge is at the surface. So we have a surface charge density, which is the amount of charge you have per unit area, uh, which means that, and again, the surface charge density is assumed to be uniform. So the next thing we have to do is we need to find the distance between a little bit of charge at the surface all the way to the point where I'm evaluating this electrical potential. So I'm gonna define that as little r, and here's kind of the vector, okay? Now, if you use the cosine rule, since I know this angle, my goal is to find little r. I know the point where I want to evaluate it is z, and I know this distance here is the radius. Uh, you can use the cosine rule simply to write that this distance of that green line uh, standard expression using the cosine rule. All right, the next thing we want to do now is uh, setting up uh, the integral, okay? So if we're going to consider just a little bit of area here at the surface, in spherical coordinates, the element of area at the surface, you can write as something like this. It's r squared sine theta d theta multiplied by d phi, where theta and phi are standard uh, definitions for spherical coordinates. The angle theta is defined with respect to the z-axis. The angle phi is not shown in this figure, but it's the angle between the x and the y, right? Uh, in, in the xy plane, rather. All right, now we consider a little bit of potential produced by this little bit of charge over here. Well, this little bit of charge has a value dq, and that's going to produce a small electrical potential over here at that point, okay? And that's all it is. At this point, all we have to do now is we have to add up all of the contributions from these small electrical potentials. All right, so what do we do? Well, the first thing you could do is you can eliminate this dq and write it in terms of our surface charge density and that little bit of area. 
And what you have to do is substitute this value of r and also our expression for that elemental area on the surface of the sphere. So how do you get the total potential now produced by every single one of these little bits of charge? Well, you have to integrate, okay? You have to add up all of the small elements of potential. That means we have to integrate over the surface. All right, so bear with me. Now it's gonna look really messy, but don't worry. It actually, there's a nice trick to evaluate that integral. So this is what it looks like. So I've taken out the constants from the integral so the K and the sigma can pop up in front. Now the angle phi in spherical coordinates, you integrate from zero to two pi, and the angle theta I integrate from zero to pi only, okay? Now I still have the radius squared. I could have taken that out of the integral because that's constant, but I'm left with sine theta in the numerator, and the denominator is that complicated expression I had for the distance from any bit of charge to the point where I'm evaluating the field. All right, so our goal now is how do you evaluate this nasty looking integral? The integral over phi is easy because there's no other dependence on phi, but let's show you how to set up this integral and evaluate it over um, this angle theta. All right, so uh, this is the integral that we had on the previous page. All I did was I evaluated the integral from zero to two pi for the angle phi, and I also took out the radius squared in the numerator brought all that to the front. Now you're left with simply an integration over the angle theta of this complicated mess. However, it turns out that although it looks really messy, it's not that bad. All you can do is use a UDU substitution to, sub, uh, to evaluate this integral. So this is what it looks like. So first you define U to be everything here inside the square root term. Okay, now if I do a UDU, I have to evaluate what DU is. So I can differentiate this with respect to theta, okay, and this is what you get, okay? So the element DU then, you don't have to worry about R squared and Z squared. These are simply constants. And if you differentiate cos theta, you're going to get minus sine theta. It's gonna take care of that other negative sign, and you're left with this. Now you look at what we have here. We have sine theta d theta. It's exactly the same term that appears in that integral in the numerator. So I'm just gonna rearrange that a little bit. So sine theta d theta is simply du divided by two multiplied by z multiplied by the radius. All right, so this substitution works, but now you also have to worry about the limits because you're doing a substitution. It means the limits also change. So let's evaluate those limits. Well, instead of um, the lower limit theta equals to zero, what do we get for u? Um, the lower limit for u then, you simply substitute theta equals to zero in my expression, and this is what I have. You do something similarly now for the upper limit, you substitute theta equals to pi, and that is my upper limit of the integral, kind of nice. So now we can go back and you can rewrite this entire integral now in terms of u and du, and this is what you get. Okay, so you integrate now from the lower limit to my upper limit, which I have defined here in green. And my expression is one over square root of u. And I've substituted the sine theta d theta by my expression. The next thing I did was I just simplified. I had twos everywhere I can cancel out. Here I had radius squared. I had another one here in the denominator. At the end, I was left with simply this integral of du divided by square root of u. And that's pretty simple to evaluate, okay? At the end, what you have to do and where it gets a little bit messy now is you have to substitute these complicated limits inside this integral. But just trust your work at this point, all right? Keep going, you're gonna get to the final answer. Okay, so this is where we are. We have to substitute our limits here, our lower and our upper limits inside this term. All right, so this is what we're going to do. Now be a little bit careful when you do that. Uh, but you should get this expression here, right? So the lower limit here has uh, the negative sign for this last term, where the upper limit has a positive sign for that same term. Now you should notice that this, both of these terms can be written as perfect squares, okay? So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to simply write them as perfect squares. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. But now you have to be a little bit careful, okay? Because uh, sometimes 
the Z is bigger than R and other times Z is less than R. And what you want is you want this square root term to be a positive number. It has to be a positive number. So although you wanna cancel out the square root and the squares here, you still have to be a little bit cautious when you do that, okay? So the first thing I would do is for points outside, what we have is that Z is bigger than R. So when I evaluate this square root of r minus z for the second term here, you have to switch the order here, okay, in order to ensure that this second term is positive, and it should be positive, right? All right, for points inside the sphere, that's not a big deal, right? For points inside the sphere, you can simply evaluate it the way I have it written right here. So this second term would simply become r minus z, okay? You could use absolute values. That also works uh, very nicely. All right, so we wanna wrap this up here. So we're gonna look at points outside the sphere. So for outside the sphere, I'm going to simplify this expression right here for my electrical potential. Uh, for outside the sphere, again, I'm choosing Z minus R for that second term. Now you can see that these Z's are going to cancel out. So you can simplify that a little bit and this whole expression inside these uh, curly brackets ends up being twice the radius. Uh, you can group things together now. Um, and at the end of the day, what you end up getting is KQ divided by Z. And remember, Z was the distance from the center all the way to that point on the Z axis where I was evaluating the potential. So this looks exactly like that from a point charge. All right, when you're inside the sphere, what you have to do now is, again, we have to flip the order here because in this case, Z is less than R. Okay, and you can see that the bracket term, um, the R's are actually going to cancel in this case, which is nice. Okay, and again, you just simplify that curly bracket, and what you get is KQ divided by the radius of the disk. So work through the math to make sure you understand that, uh, but this is how it works out. As you would expect, you expect to get the exact same results as before, and we can do that also. Before, we didn't have this surface charge density, but if you use the definition of the surface charge density as being the total charge of the object, divided by the total area of that sphere, which is four pi r squared, you're gonna get the exact same expressions as we had. There is no denying it. All right, and the last thing you should always do is make a nice sketch of what's going on. So we had two expressions. So if you plot potential as a function of distance from the center of that sphere, what you have is a constant value all the way until you get to the radius of the sphere and then it starts to drop, right? It starts getting smaller and it behaves as a one over R dependence, okay? So that's it for me, folks. Thanks for watching. Hopefully you appreciate uh, some things in this video, okay? We'll see you next time.